Congratulations, right-wingers. You accomplished something this year. In 2024, the right wing has already forced Harvard University to replace their uh, far left, um, not really, you know, not necessarily hardline anti-Zionist, but not super pro-Zionist president with a... Uh, with a really lefty Zionist president. I guess we're supposed to be happy about this. This is supposed to be a win. Harvard University is now somehow going to be like less of a cesspool. It's going to be um, a better. It's going to produce graduates who are less crazy. It's going to be less of a pernicious influence uh, on American society. Uh Harvard graduates who disproportionately control the major institutions in America, um, they're somehow going to be a better crop of people because we got rid of the Harvard president who was not like a total shill for Israel. And now they've replaced her with someone who has all the exact same views who has all the same political values, has the exact same view of America, but is just, you know, 100% pro-Israel, whatever they do. This is why I... This is the only reason why I think... Or why I care, really, even about Israel beyond an academic... um, Beyond, like, an academic sense. Because in the abstract, or I shouldn't say in the abstract, it's the opposite. In reality, what happens in Israel should not affect what goes on here in the United States. And so whatever our opinions may be of what goes on in Israel or in Gaza or anywhere around there in the Middle East, it's not directly affecting us here. And so we shouldn't necessarily have to care about it. Now, we can care about it for personal reasons, because we care about the human cost or something like that, or just because we're interested in it, but it shouldn't uh, have directly mm, uh, affect life in America. I think that until there's some kind of controversy uh, involving Israel, and then all of a sudden um, the brains of much of the American right just sort of break Something snaps in in the minds of American conservatives. Almost universally, they're people who consider themselves conservatives. You know, very few people who are sort of outside of the mainstream conservative um, paradigm are um, sort of pathologically pro-Israel. I mean, they could be pro-Israel, but not pathologically so to where you can't speak to them. But anyway, that becomes all of a sudden the most important issue to them. It becomes more important than any domestic issue. (laughs) Like to them, you can have all sorts of disagreements. You can believe in um, uh, uh, child gender mutilation. That's fine. But, (laughs) you know, that could be – that's just a simple disagreement, you know, amongst Americans. Okay, yeah, we have different political views. You know, you think that uh, five-year-olds should be castrated – And I don't think that. Okay? It's a difference of opinion. But I think that uh, Israel was anointed by God, and they can do no wrong, and you think that Israel should be judged like any other country. You are my mortal enemy. You know, that's what makes Israel's influence in the United States so unique. Because you compare them... Uh, to other countries that get lots of U.S. aid. Like, let's just say collectively the Sunni Arab world receives a lot of aid from the United States, and we let them get away with all sorts of terrible things. Much in the same way with Israel. We give them lots of money, and we let them get away with terrible things. But no one in America um, is going to give you crap over calling out the Sunni Arab world. We're allowed to criticize Sunni Arabs and Muslims all we want, as we should, for things that they do wrong with American money. 
you're allowed to dislike that. But all of a sudden, when Israel, another country in the Middle East that happens to um, practice a different religion, when you criticize them over similar issues, then all of a sudden, that is verboten. And that is something that can get powerful people like the president of Harvard removed. The American right was actually able to muster enough of a push to get her removed. I mean, we could never do that over any other issue. This is the one thing. I mean, hell, Harvard, this Harvard president could have sanctioned um, like public abortions in – I don't know, the cafeteria, and then um, chopped up the aborted babies and put them into omelets and served them to the students. I think you would have had a harder time getting the Harvard president removed over that than over her tepid, um, her, her tepid defense of Israel. Because I don't believe she ever said anything that was outwardly like anti-Israel. I think she was just not pro-Israel enough because she was, you know, I think she was she was told to like condemn students who didn't like Israel or who said mean words about Israelis. Um, and I think she didn't condemn the students strongly enough. And that's all it took. Bill Ackman has now claimed uh, two heads of major American universities. First, uh, Penn. And now Harvard. Next, apparently, he's going after MIT. And Bill Ackman claims <laughs> uh, to be doing this because he is uh, anti-diversity, equity, and inclusion. And he's a, he's a newfound convert to the anti-DEI uh, movement. And he is wants to take out these um, uh, university presidents because of their DEI support, which... Uh, you know, he he um, equates the lack of support for Israel with DEI, which I'm not necessarily getting into whether or not that's like a, a fair um, uh, argument or not. Um, you can believe that that's a separate issue of whether or not um, being uh, against Israel is a part of the DEI agenda. Um, you certainly can't argue that. But I would say here that in the case of Bill Ackman, who for those of you who don't know, Bill Ackman, big rich investor guy, um, believe he's a billionaire. I mostly know him for going on CNBC and crying every time the markets are down. He's really always seemed quite pathetic, in my opinion. But then again, you know, he's the billionaire and I'm the schlub. But I don't know, if I were a billionaire, I feel like I wouldn't go on CNBC and cry and beg to be bailed out by the Fed uh, every time. I have a bad day at work. But anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. Um, the reason why I'm so skeptical of uh, Bill Ackman's uh, motives is because he had to have known that you get rid of one of these people, you're going to get someone who believes in exactly the same things and who believes in all of the same diversity nonsense but is pro-Israel. Because those people exist, there's plenty of them. It's not hard to find, um, you know, a, uh, a stalwart of the American left. I'm not going to say like some, you know, the term far left is so, too, is so muddled. Um, I don't want to use that term. Uh, although I'm trying to say, like, left in a very general sense. Um, you know, left-wing as in the, the, the establishment of what these universities represent. You know, you know what an American college professor is like. And it's easy enough to find someone who fits that mold, who checks all the boxes, who just happens to be pro-Israel. And lo and behold, that's exactly what Harvard did. They promoted someone who was already... Um, you know, a uh, major, uh, you know, pretty major figure there because this guy was apparently the provost. And you don't get to be the provost of Harvard by being some, uh, you know, anti-establishment um, uh, mover and shaker 
who wants to change things up and uh, do away with diversity quotas. You get to be the provost at Harvard by being just like everyone else and believing in the exact same things. And then you get promoted from provost to president by believing in all those things and supporting Israel. You know, I heard something remarkable today on the radio. It was a Buck Sexton, who, who I like, you know, generally. I think he seems like a nice, level-headed guy. Um, I'm sure I've disagreements with him or whatever. But he said something remarkable today, which was, um, if you th- if you have essentially any criticism of Israel, you are, uh, I think he said, morally reprehensible or morally bankrupt, something like that. Because he said, if you think that there are that there have been any um, uh, excesses um, in the war in Gaza, or that Israel has um, has been you know too strong, or um, been excessive in their assault on Gaza. If you have any criticism, essentially, that's what that means. If you're saying there are any excesses, you think that Israel has gone at all overboard, even by 1%, <laughs> you are morally reprehensible. I mean, this is how... It, and he's not even someone who I think of as a hardcore Zionist. You know, certainly, yeah, pro-Israel guy, because you're a mainstream American talk radio host. But morally reprehensible for having any – there's no room for criticism at all. There's no room for debate about the way in which Israel has prosecuted this particular war. You know, that is the kind of fundamentalism that you don't see um, in any other topic. At least in other topics, there is a um, pretense of open debate. Like the left will pretend to be open to debate and then just call you a bigot for disagreeing with them. But the right just says flat out, if the topic of Israel comes up, it's whatever Netanyahu says, and there is no debate. Netanyahu's word is final. And, you know, I I keep talking about this more than anything uh, over the last few weeks because I just don't understand. The longer it goes on, the less I understand... Um, the people who are afflicted by this. And yes, you know, they are right in, um, when they say, you know, oh, there are certain people whose brains are just, you know, broken by Israel. You know, and they're talking about the anti-Israel crowd. But sure, those people exist. I don't know many of them personally. Actually, I don't think I know any of them. I don't know anyone who's like, you know, a deranged, oh, Israel's always wrong. But I see them on like Twitter and stuff or on the internet. Um, it's always existed. And usually it's just complete over – it's just a, the, the people who instinctively think Jews are behind every problem in the world. Yeah, those people exist, and those are usually the people who say, well, Israel is you know, always the problem no matter what. The, you know, they blame everything on Israel even when Israel is not the topic of conversation. But then they have absolutely zero self-awareness and have no sense of irony in that they think that Israel is always uh, in the right and always – uh, you know, and always the solution, and never possibly the problem. There is no conceivable situation um, wherein Israel could be in the wrong. And they don't see that at all as crazy. They don't see that all as um, extreme. And so, for me, who has no passion at stake, you know, in the conflict with Israel or whatever. Um, because it doesn't affect me directly. I just don't understand. I mean, people these days on the right are more level-headed and objective about um, America and its foreign policy and its wars than they are about Israel's. You know, I mean, this is like talking to someone, you know, back in 2003 about, uh, you know, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, they're that pro the war in Gaza. They're basically saying, you know, they're, they're like, you know, full on George Bush, either you're with us or you're with the terrorists. But, you know, on the U.S. wars, people have evolved and they've realized, oh, you don't know, it's more nuanced than that. And actually, some of these wars were BS and we were lied about them. But they don't consider that that could be the case when it comes to Israel. So I wonder... Considering that eventually people um, people did come to their senses when it came to American wars, if people will ever wake up uh, when it comes to 
um, Israel's wars and the, and the idea that perhaps the Israeli government is fallible. That's all it is. All you have to do is consider the possibility that things that the government says and does might not always be correct. It's that simple because once you accept that, then all of a sudden you become open to debate and the whole facade shatters and you start to look at things um, with a more critical lens. Once people were removed enough from the war on terror that the emotions died down and they looked at things more objectively, yeah, <laughs> there's no one who defends them anymore. They're like, oh yeah, that was stupid. And you know what? Back in 2003, for the most part, I would imagine that most of the people who were against the Iraq war you know, were the, like, the crazy Harvard University types who had bad arguments, probably. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to say that too um, um, assuredly because I wasn't really around back then. I don't really remember the debates. But if you had the same people like liberal college students who are just – they're not good at debating. They're not good at arguing anything. They don't know a whole lot. They're not very smart. Or I should say they're, they might be smart in the sense that maybe if they, they have the capability to learn things. Um, you know, They might have a high IQ, but they lack knowledge. And so in the same way, if you ask um, uh, you know, a, a random Harvard student to explain why Israel is bad, they're probably not going to make the best argument. So with that said, I, I think I'll end it there for today.